Thanks for the introduction, Paul. That's working. Okay, good. Hello, everybody. Um, I've changed the title of the um, talk slightly, as you tend to do when you've had three months to cogitate over what you're going to say. So um, this has been concerning me for some years now, trying to get the best out of Tasmania's forest plantation estate and also how it um, uh, relates to the rest of forestry in Tasmania with native forests. I'll try to st stay strategic and not get into very fine-grained detail. Um, and uh, I need to stay away from recommending particular policies uh, because CSIRO people are generally supposed to present facts rather than advocate policies. So here's a bit of what I'll try to cover in my talk. Um, why plantations in the first place? some basics on Tasmania's forest plantations and how that relates to the global plantation setting. I'll talk a bit about technological change in wood processing and international competitiveness. If we're going to have a plantation industry in Tasmania, in the long run it has to, be, it has to compete as an industry with other people that grow plantations. I'll go into some details of the research we've done in the CRC about processing plantation timbers and say a bit about what hopefully might be a, um, a sustainable future. So normally when people um, say, you think, oh, plantations, that's easy. Plantations grow faster than native forests um, and you get more wood. That's, not, that's sort of true, but it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, you can certainly get a tree up to a, a given size in a plantation faster than you can in a natural forest and part of the reason for that is in a natural forest after a disturbance many stems come up and only a few of them make it through and depending on the age that you harvest it, this is a plot up in the Styx Valley where Steve Reed's standing next to a 400 year old tree, a lot of the biomass that was produced by that plantation, by that natural forest, those trees have died and they're gone into the big pile of vegetable mound that Steve's standing on whereas in this pine plantation down the road, I think also in the Styx Valley, maybe 70 or 80 per cent of the above, bi -ground, above, above ground biomass is available to uh, put, the, put in a truck and take off to produce saw logs and, and pulp logs for um, the Boyer Newsprint Mill. Here's some statistics about plantations in Australia and in and Tasmania, which may surprise uh, some of you. They certainly surprise me when I go over them. So there's as of about 2010, uh, there's a bit over 300,000 hectares of forest plantation t in Tasmania and 230,000 of those are eucalypt plantations. There's really only two species planted in plantations in Tasmania, Eucalyptus globulus blue gum and Eucalyptus nitens shining gum, which comes from naturally from Victoria and New South Wales. Um, 49.7% of the area of Tasmania is forested, and that includes the plantations, and 22.2% uh, of our land surface area is in forested secure conservation reserves. Um, so 4.5% of our land area in the state is plantations, and even before any forthcoming forest peace deals, this surprised me, uh, only 563,000 hectares of public native forest is actually available for the woodman's axe or chainsaw as they would use now. So a lot of that land that you see in the forestry Tasmania estate would be what they tend to call headroom, land around streams and sensitive areas which would never be logged. So we're already up to this point where round about the area of plantations in Tasmania is around about half the area of land available for public native forest logging. So um, currently the plantations that we have, uh, the pine plantations are a well established thing. They're producing saw logs for sawmills in Tasmania and also pulp wood for the Norska Scoob pulp mill up at uh, uh, Boya near New Norfolk. Uh, whereas the eucalypt plantations to date have been primarily producing um, pulp wood which has been sent overseas as export wood chips. And of course there was people hoping that the, there'd be a pulp mill built in Tasmania by now that would be using that pulp wood. 
And the, the production of logs that are suitable for saw and veneering, or maybe suitable, is just commencing with the plantations that were managed for that purpose, set up by Forestry Tasmania, especially commencing in the 1990s. So if you look at the well-known um, West report, Professor Jonathan West, he says the future of the Tasmanian forest products industry resides in the transition to plantations. Now, I, I wouldn't entirely agree with that myself. I think there still is a future for high value timber from native forests as well. I couldn't resist adding this uh, little cartoon that uh, sort of been published in the Canberra Times in about 12 years ago by Jeff, Jeff Pryor. Um, we certainly seem to be in this spirit, so we'd uh, better make sure that we have plantations that um, you know, are an effective investment and, uh, and, and, and are good for society. Apologies to anyone, anyone offended. So, um, where do our plantations fit in in the world? This is a map produced by a, a chap in Spain that, that some of you have met, um, a eucalypt enthusiast actually, and it shows you that there's about 20 million hectares of eucalypt plantations worldwide. That's about three times the land area of the whole of Tasmania. So our, our plantations in Tasmania are only about 1.2% of uh, the total area of the world's eucalypt plantations. There's around about 260,000 hectare, million hectares of forest plantations worldwide, and that includes other species like pine and teak and so on. And uh, according to FAO, they have the potential to meet about two-thirds of the global industrial roundwood demand. So I can assure you that the world isn't waiting with bated breath to see exactly what we do with our forests in Tasmania. It's, it's, we're in a competitive world environment and there's plenty of other plantations and um, other eucalypt plantations and other pine plantations. One of the questions that people often ask about plantations, and you'll see letters in the Mercury and so on saying, oh, plantations, the soil will be ruined and you know, it'll only be any good for one rotation. And uh, I would say that Tasmanian plantations, by and large, are well managed and have good prospects for sustainable wood production over multiple rotations. So in other words, the yield per hectare, tonnes of wood per hectare, should stay the same or even get better with good plantation management over successive rotations. Whereas practices in some other parts of the world fill me with um, considerable alarm. I'm engaged with um, uh, Dr. Sadan Nambia, that some of you know, a um, world expert on plantation sustainability. We're reviewing sustainable plantation production in, in Southeast Asia and you see practices like this where the people are digging up all the roots and taking all the little leaves and twigs and things from a eucalypt plantation, grown on a short rotation and then burning it for biofuel. So you're, you're sort of getting a you're really ripping all the organic matter out of the soil. You know, we don't do that here. And here in Vietnam, they're using a bulldozer to prepare planting sites on vulnerable soils where you get typhoons and they're annually ploughing between the rows of trees to control weeds. And, uh, you know, but I think we have a very strong forest practices code and forest um, practices authority and you can look up on the web and see the sort of governance we have for plantations and for native forests here and I can assure you that's a lot better than many of the other plantations in the world. So, okay, what can we produce from plantations? And, uh, you know, if you watch the news or read the paper, the dialogue in Tasmania is always about it's a saw log, no, it's a pulpwood, no, it's a saw log. There's two things, but there's a whole range of other wood products that can be produced from plantation trees. Um, some of them like rotary veneer, where you peel it off a, a log, sliced veneer, where you slice it off, um, and various sort of engineered boards, where you either grind the wood right down into sawdust or into small flakes and then compress it. Most of you, you would be fam familiar with medium density fibre board, um, particle board, there's a thing called orientated strand board which is getting very big and uh, once you've got your veneers for example or, or small dimension boards you can glue them up into various engineered wood products, plywood is an obvious one. Also um, Forestry Tasmania has recently launched a pro product called hard lamb that they might 
give you a look at here after the talk. Um, and laminated beams, I'm a, I'm a keen viewer of grand designs and you can see many of these products being deployed in fancy buildings in the UK and other places if you watch that program. Some of you, and I'll reveal my age here, can remember an old um, engineered wood product called Burnie Board that was made up in Burnie. Um, actually, I think from native forest hardwood in, in Tasmania, which used to swell up and get a bit soggy when it got wet, so we have better ones now. Um, this is a slide from Yako Pori Consulting that I, I pinched from my friend Stephen Medgley, who I think pinched it from them, but it, the main point there is that it, it's been the trend and it's forecast that these engineered wood products will gain in, product, gain in, in, in prominence in the world market relative to just straight saw logs, if you like, sawing up trees into boards. And there's reasons for that we'll go into a bit later. Here's a, here's a photo from um, southern China, Guangxi province, the big province next to Vietnam. And um, these eucalypt logs, uh, when they were planted, people would have thought they were going to sell them to a pot mill. But in the last 10 years, there's been an explosive growth of veneering using these small spindleless lathes. And they can veneer logs down to eight centimetres diameter. A log this big, not much bigger than a baseball bat. And you get a little core out of it that the lady's holding and you get these sheets of eucalypt veneer plywood. Eucalypt veneer, which are then taken off to plywood factories. In China, went from being a plywood importer to the world's biggest plywood exporter in less than a decade. So, we can't even make a pair of underpants in Australia now. can continue having an Australian forest products industry. The industry certainly struggled though, over the last decade because of the rise of the Australian dollar. When Forestry Tasmania started doing its pruning and thinning to um, produce saw log plantations, you know, you, if you're thinking, can I sell this internationally or even locally, the Australian dollar was not much more than half as powerful as what it is now. And that means that, you know, in a, in a, a global market, um, sawn timber from other countries can come in and, and compete much more readily than it, than, it, than it would have if the dollar had stayed where it was. And you can see that our mineral exports completely dwarf our forest products exports. Nonetheless, the Australian forest pro forestry industry, including growing trees and manufacturing trees, is still a big industry. It's $23 billion annual turnover and it employs about 6% of the Australian manufacturing workforce. So, a bit more on international competitiveness. In the, the last um, decade, China went from exporting wood chips to importing a lot of them. And there's the, the, brown, the brown one, the brownish yellow one, for those that are not colour blind, um, is Australia's share of those imports. And the blue one is Vietnam. It's a country I've been going over to for the last 20 years. So why were they successful in expanding their wood chip sales to China and we weren't? Um, actually, the growth rates of plantations in Vietnam are really pretty similar to ours. They range from less than 10 <coughs> tonnes of wood per hectare per year to more than 30. Um, but they operate on very short rotations, partly because the, about half the plantations are grown by small farmers who want to get the trees cut down the money in their pocket as soon as they possibly can. So you won't find many people extending a rotation beyond eight or ten years. And uh, they're growing acacias, uh, which are easy to grow. Uh, they get their land allocated free from the government. That's a good thing for them. And they've got a very good network of roads uh, leading down to a whole lot of ports and little wood chip mills. So they've done very well out of this. and. Uh, uh, it would be pretty hard for, pretty hard to compete with them in growing wood chips for the China market. Another interesting thing about Vietnam is they've gone very rapidly to being the world's third biggest wooden furniture producer. But 80% of the wood they bring in is from other countries and you can see flitches of eucalypt wood from South America and logs from Indonesia and uh, so on in Laos in Vietnamese furniture factories. And you know, I, I don't 
have any moral problem with Tasmania growing logs and selling them to Vietnam for their furniture industry if we can do it profitably without subsidy. And that's, you know, it's a thing that can be done by Tasmanian growers. So thinking about Tasmania um, and our plantations, I ripped this slide off from the, again, from the, the Intergovernmental Agreement Independent Verification Group. I think I got that acronym right. And uh, this is a sort of, shows pictures of the um, Tasmania's private plantations. It doesn't show forestry Tasmania's plantations. The, the brown ones is eucalyptus nitens. There's some, a few blue ones, you've got this globulus, and then there's some other ones that don't show up well here, um, radiata pine plantations. They're roughly distri distributed around the state as follows, and the same goes for forestry Tasmania's plantations. About 40% of the plantation areas in the northwest, 40% in the northeast, and 20% in the southeast. So if you look at the forecasts of pruned <laughs> plantation saw logs from forestry Tasmania, by around 2025 we might be they might be in a position to sell you around about 100,000 cubic metres of these logs per year. And you think that sounds a lot, and it is. I mean, the, the whole cut of native forest logs now is about 150,000 cubic metres per year. But, you know, for a world competitive eucalypt sawmill, that's not even really enough for one sawmill. You, you, might just, you, you can probably just get away with run, running one big sawmill with that much wood to compete with other people that are growing eucalypts in plantations and thinning and pruning them. And then you'd have this logistic problem, but where do you put the sawmill? Uh, if you, probably the logical centre of gravity for it is up around Bell Bay somewhere where you can draw in the northwest and the northeast plantations and the southeast. The other point about plant processing plantation trees, so I'll put this picture in from a thinned and pr pr pruned plantation, is that you'll always uh, have a You'll get your nice saw log here. Is this working? Anyway, nice big diamond saw log. You'll always have tops. You'll have some smaller trees. And to create this plantation, you've had to thin the plantation. So you'll always have smaller diameter wood. And to be, for it to be profitable for the grower and for the processor, you have to be able to use the, the smaller diameter wood and also the offcuts from sawing or the leftovers from veneering. And traditionally, we've sort of thought of pulp wood as a good market. There's other possible markets. You might make it in some sort of composite wood product or perhaps even burn it for bioenergy. But you, I could draw the analogy with a, a butcher and uh, cows. You know, if you, if you buy cows from a farmer and you only think you're only going to sell rump steak and you can't sell the rest of the cow, the mince and blood and bone and so on, you'll go broke. And the same applies to plantation saw logs and, and native forest logs too. So um, we're in a difficult situation in Tasmania. If you compare us to a, a grower in Victoria with the same plantation and a processor in Victoria, you know, to get our stuff to world markets, it generally tends to be more expensive because of high shipping costs. So they can just run their product down from the factory to the Melbourne port, whereas we have to stick it on a small ship at high expense and offload it and then load it on, on again to the world markets unless we can sell all of it in Australia. So that suggests to me as a, a general point, and I'm not going to argue the fine economics here, that you either want to get big enough to be able to charter your own ships, like Taran does, for example, down on the wharf in Hobart here, send them straight off to the market, or else produce something, if you're going to produce something small, produce it high enough value that it can bear those high shipping costs. That might be something like fine furniture, for example, or even window frames, so something really quite valuable. Um, I'll now turn to this unfortunate subject. Um, we all know that these schemes that were brought in to expand the area of Australian plantations, uh, you know, virtually all of them have failed now. And uh, it's a lesson in public policy, I think. Um, financial incentives for plantations need to be designed very carefully to avoid perverse outcomes. So there was a target of expanding the area of plantations, but not sufficient attention to whether they'd be good plantations or 
what they'd produce. And as a result, quite a lot of the plantations that were put in will only last one rotation and go back to, um, then go back to agriculture. And there was also an inflexibility introduced in the marketing arrangement, so it was very difficult to, you know, it would be possible to convert the best of these plantations to growing saw logs, for example, but then you'd have to do things like extend the rotation length and maybe do thinning and pruning operations, and that would be very difficult under the financial arrangements. And it also, it led to people buying a bit of a land boom, increasing land prices, and also people putting in trees where they probably won't grow very well, such as I could, I could allude to eucalyptus nitens out around Buckland where the annual rainfall is only about 600, 700 millimetres and that species really needs about eight or 900 millimetres minimum for good growth. So despite all that, we have got some saw log in inverted commas plantations in Tasmania. Uh, so the compensatory funding over previous forest peace deals has allowed Forestry Tasmania to do these thinning and pruning operations. Um, but there's around about 25,000 hectares of these. It's a bit hard to pin down exactly how many. depends exactly how you define how far you've got with the thinning and pruning operations. With the recent things like closure of Tribuna Woodchip Mill, it's got harder to do this kind of plantation because they haven't been able to sell the pulpwood thinnings. Um, now, I should get into a bit of e very little bit of economics here. The basic reason you do those thinning and pruning operations is you want to produce select or standard grade boards which fetch a much higher price per, per cubic metre. These are wholesale prices out of the sawmill and they're about five years old, but they're just indicative of the kind of thing. The larger diameter board you can produce. These are 25 millimetre thick boards, so wider boards fetch more money. Now if it's got lots of defects in it, like you get from, typically get from unpruned trees, you don't get a high, you don't get a high price and your sawmill goes broke. Um, so it's generally the accepted wisdom that, that pruning and thinning is required to produce high value appearance grade sawn products from Tasmanian eucalypt plantations. And the two species we have, particularly night ends, are very good at holding onto their branches in plantations and that creates defects in the wood. But it's expensive to prune the trees, so if we can work out a ways of silviculture where we can get away from that pruning cost, you can reduce the cost of the logs to the processing industry. Just so a bit about the outcomes of research we've done in the Cooperative Research Centre for Forestry. At it turns out that the two species that can be grown well in Tasmanian plantation, eucalypt plantations, have pretty different issues, if you like. Um, they both really um, look like they're better off pruned to get rid of all these knots in the, in, in the log. Um, Eucalyptus globulus is quite hard and stiff enough for most applications, things like flooring. Um, Night ends is a bit marginal. Um, it's, it's sort of relatively low density and low, low hardness. So if you're wearing high heeled shoes, you might dent your eucalyptus night ends floor, for example. There's a thing called tension wood that occurs when trees are growing in, grow in a particular way and that leads to intense shrinkage bands and this can be a real problem in eucalyptus globulus and you have to be very careful the way you grow them. That hasn't been a problem in, in um, in eucalyptus night ends. Whereas the main, a big problem in eucalyptus night ends is, is checking, which means cracking as the wood dries. And that's a, that's a cross section of a night ends board that's been dried in a kiln and then it's been re steam reconditioned. So the, the checks have closed up and we call them closed checks, but they're still there. Those little fractures in the wood are still there. And that will affect certain markets. You wouldn't want a window frame made out of night ends because it would tend to open up with the changes in moisture in the sun and the frost and so on and you, you end up getting defects going into it. But I personally think that some markets like um, panelling and certain kinds of indoor furniture, I wouldn't be too worried about buying a home entertainment, 
home, home entertainment unit made out of eucalyptus nitens boards that had a few, few internal checks in. I wouldn't even see them and I can you come up and see a piece of nitens afterwards. Um, and that, uh, very briefly too, I'll cover off on this issue of quarter sawing um, and, and back sawing. And I've tried to illustrate what a, a quarter sawn board, the growth rings, it's sawn on a particular way in the log and the growth rings run across um, the width, across the narrow dimension of the board. And that performs much better in service because it doesn't shrink as much as a, a back sawn board, which will tend to shrink and distort more in service. So there's some quarter sawn boards from a processing trial that a lot of us were involved in up at from logs from Gould's country, but one of the first Tasmania saw log plantations. Tony Yeager sitting in the audience there was involved in sawing up the logs and Peter Volker I can see there involved in assessing the boards and so on. That's Russell Washerson who led this research. So one obvious point is to get logs up to that size where they can be quarter sawn. I should have said You'll only caught, you can't get a quarter sawn board out of a very small diameter log because you need to get that width of, of board. You know, you get one in the middle of the log which will have unpruned bit and then another quarter sawn board on the other side. So you really need to thin the plantation to get the logs up to that size in any reasonable period of time. And to, um, so you can see there, this is, a, this is the results of a thinning trial after 22 years. These, these ones were big enough to quarter saw. They're in a heavily thin plot, whereas this unthin plot, most of the trees much too small to quarter saw. So some of us have been over to Spain and seen an industry there that's been developed on a small scale using big unpruned logs of eucalyptus globulus. And there's no doubt that this is producing high quality veneer. There's fiddleback veneer from unpruned globulus in Spain and quarter sawn boards and window frames for the German market fetch a very high price, glue lamb beams. But you know, our, our silver culture in Tasmania is actually the envy of the Galicians in Spain. They, they have to run around and get every now and again they'll find a log in a, an, un, an untended plot that's big enough for these applications. And uh, so they come over here to look at our, our silver culture, whereas we, we go over there to get a snapshot into the future of a, a globulus wood processing industry. And that's good. Um, processing in Chile, and they've actually been picking up on some of the research we've done in the CRC, and they're, they're doing more trials on thin section globulus, uh, night ends boards. And they're finding they can largely get around this checking problem, but then the issue will be to develop markets for that kind of wood. And again, I think it's great that different countries are collaborating. We've got a Chilean PhD student in the room uh, here you can talk to. Mario, where are you, Mario? Somewhere here. And, uh, you know, both, both countries benefit and it can be marketed jointly too. So this is a sort of my general proposition. In the long run, if we're going to have a forest plantation industry in Tasmania, there's two criteria must be met. Firstly, it must be profitable to grow the trees in successive rotations to produce logs that meet the specifications of processes. And number two, it must be profitable for the processes to process and sell the wood products while paying the growers a price consistent with 0.1. That's pretty unarguable to me. Uh, so this is a, an example, and there's just a, um, illustrate that point. And this is, this is a, what you call a desktop study but by Russell Washerson that's based on, it's based on actual mill throughput and cost data and uh, built a virtual sawmill on a spreadsheet and the indication was that if you're going to run a big eucalypt mill, modern eucalypt mill designed to saw eucalypts, plantation eucalypts, and you want to get a rate of return on your investment of 15%, which is a pretty reasonable return, um, you, you could afford to pay, and, and if you got the rates of recovery that we've already demonstrated in research trials of the higher value products, then you could probably be afford to pay at the mill door around about $120 per cubic metre for the pruned logs. Of course, it's much more complicated than that. They also have to be selling the 
unpruned top logs and the thinnings and so on to make it work. But that's the kind of study you can do. And here's another one, and a lot of you would be familiar with that product Eco Ash, the company FEA has gone out of business now, but I actually think this was a good innovative idea, but it was a, a sort of different value chain, a lower, you pay, you'd be paying less for a, an unpruned un log from an unthinned plantation, putting it through this machine here, which is called a hue saw, a bit like a sausage factory, the log just goes in, the boards come out, you're getting lower recovery of a lower value product. You can have a look at it here. This is a bit of eco ash. But um, you have to be able to sell the rest of the wood here, either for wood chips or some manufactured product. And uh, the, um, you, can, you, can, you can be getting wood from only 10 year old plantations. So this was competing head to head with radiata pine. I still think it's quite a good idea and it might have a, you might be able to revive this sort of methodology perhaps to produce a, a new, new uh, engineered product like cross laminated timber or something like that. It, but you'd be, it's what we call a lower cost value chain. We've already done a few rotary veneering trials with Nitens logs and yeah, results are reasonable but the, there are issues and the volume recovery was less than the native forest logs and the stiffness wasn't really up to what they wanted for the flooring products they produce. So there's follow-up research trials are now being planned in detail and about to commence to look at plantation nitens and globulus. And it's, it's not just a matter of producing the veneer, we also have to track it through to an actual product that people buy, you know, in the building industry. So uh, finally, yeah, I, the future will be challenging for plantation forestry in Tasmania. There's no free rides, you know, we're in competition with the rest of the world. But, you know, we've got Australia, Asia's growing wealth. We're not that far away from Asia. The big markets, Bombay, Shanghai and so on. Um, assuming there's no e ecological catastrophes or wars or anything, the demand for wood will be there. Suggest we should focus on products that build on the strengths of our plantation species and our silviculture. Uh, of course, you'll always hear this said, and it's true, resource security is vital for manufacturing investment. If I'm going to invest $20 million in a large engineered wood product or products factory or a billion dollars in a pulp mill, I want to be pretty, pretty sure that I can get that supply of wood to run over the year, over the life of the factory. Um, and uh, there we are. So finally, I offer you my wooden boat rebuild as a metaphor for all of what I've been talking about. Um, it, it includes um, both, both native forest timber from old growth Tasmanian native forests, w timbers that can't be grown in plantations and which are unique to here, important for our culture and our artistic uh, people and so on. It's also got engineered wood products. Um, I don't think they actually were from plantations but they could have been from hoop pine plantations in Queensland, they make good marine ply out of that. And I can assure you, having looked at my bank balance, that there was a very, very heavy employment ratio generated in producing this rebuild. Uh, I also thought of putting up, um, well, I could take, you could take a walk around Salamanca Place on a Saturday morning and you'll see similar sorts of use of native forest timbers. Or if, I was, if you wanted to get a home entertainment unit I'd, on my mind recently because I'd bought this off large size screen, screen TV and uh, they're pretty expensive and I figured they sell for about $2,000 and they contain about $200 worth of blackwood or hue and pine or, or taz oak. So uh, you think of all the employment that's generated in making those and you can't do that in Vietnam unless you buy the logs from Tasmania at high expense. So thanks very much everybody for listening and uh, I'm very pleased to take any questions. Um, thanks to the people that helped me do the talk.